I'm extremely nervous. Um, <laughs> I'm nervous because this is really, really important to me, and I want to make sure I do it right. Um, <clears throat> So my sobriety date is September 1st, 2012. I have a home group. This is my home group. We meet on Tuesday nights um, at 8 p.m. for a closed discussion meeting and then Saturday nights for an open speaker. I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor and I sponsor women in the program. I'm just gonna start from the beginning. I'm supposed to tell you what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida, raised in Jacksonville. Um, my mother was very young when she had me, and so I spent a lot of time with uh, my grandparents, my grandmother, my grandfather, um, aunts, uncles, and um, from f for all of those years, um, what it taught me was I learned every everybody's household that I went to, um, I had to act differently. I had to put on a face or an act um, while I was there. Some people's houses I went to, they had alcohol there and it was laid back. And some people's houses, you know, some of my grandmother's, my grandmother or my great grandmother's house, there was no alcohol, there was a lot of religion and I had to act accordingly. So I learned really, really young to be a chameleon, um, to be what you wanted me to be and act the way that I thought you wanted me to act, not who I was or I had no idea who I was. So um, when I was seven, my mother um, married and we moved to Detroit, Michigan. And so I'm this little Southern girl up in the suburbs of Detroit and I'm extremely different. I get made fun of for my accent um, and my name, of course, everywhere I went, my name was horrible. Um, <clears throat> and so I just wanted to fit in. And this is the first time I could remember, I don't know why I thought this, but um, I thought if I had glasses and braces that that would make me fit in and that I would be cool. I don't know why, but um, so I lied and, you know, I, they couldn't fix my teeth. They were fine, but went to the doctor and I lied and, um, and got glasses um, to change who I was so that because I just wasn't comfortable with me, um, I thought if I had glasses that I would be different. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember when I took my first drink. Um, it was somewhere, somewhere in there. The the grandparents that were in Detroit, they had they always had like five cases of alcohol or beer in their fridge, and I used to always have to go down and get uh, my grandpa a beer. And um, I vaguely remember taking sips of it, but I do remember the first time that I came out of a blackout <clears throat> um, distinctly. I was 12, about to turn 13. Um, I'd been staying at my grandmother's in Tennessee and I came home and so we threw this big party and um, I remember when I woke up the next day I remember bits and pieces of that night um, I, re I remember feeling at ease but everybody telling me the things that I said and the things that I did and I was funny and um, I remember I feel prettier and I was smarter and I wanted to do it again and again as much as possible um, so that's what I started to do. Anytime I could drink, I did. And I had a friend whose mom let us drink and would buy us alcohol. And um, so school at that point became an afterthought. I just never went. Um, and we drank and other things came in too, um, as much as possible. And uh, my mom and her husband um, couldn't control me. I was sneaking out at night. I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And so she decided to send me to Florida um, to live with my aunt. And my aunt was 10 years older than me, her is 10 years older than me, and uh, she was a bartender. So when, when I was getting home from school, I mean, or wherever I was during the day, because I never went to school, um, she was leaving for work. And if she was coming home that night, if she came home, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning. So I had all afternoon to do whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted. And I had no rules. She'd leave me a pack of cigarettes and a little bit of money. And, and so... When I moved to Florida, I sought out those same friends, those people that drank like I did, wanted to drink all of the time, that partied, um, <clears throat> you know, older guys, um, friends with older sisters that could get us alcohol, and that's all I did, that's all I thought about, um, and I didn't see absolutely anything wrong with it, and, and it was okay in the house, you know, my aunt knew what I was doing, eventually my mom came down too, and she was doing her thing, um, she had just went through a divorce, and um, we were just drinking constantly. I mean, there were times that I had to drag my aunt in because she was so drunk and someone dropped her off on the front porch, and then vice versa. Um, so this went on for a little while, and I, 
I um, convinced my mom that I could go back to Michigan and live with this guy that I knew. And so um, at 15, I moved out, and I moved back in with this guy in Detroit. And, um, you know, I was going to be a grown-up. I quit school and got a job and, you know, made enough money to support myself and um, was trying to play house, I guess. (laughs) And I wasn't very good at it. And uh, so... He wasn't really a drinker, and um, there were many times where, you know, I would say I'm going to go out for, you know, I'm going to go over to my friend's house for a little while, and um, I wouldn't show up for back, I wouldn't come back for a couple days, or, I mean, I just never knew um, what was going to happen when I started drinking, and obviously that didn't work out, and I left, and I went back, um, at this point, my mom's in Pittsburgh, and I'd been to Pittsburgh a little bit, I moved around a lot, Um, I get confused even trying to Put, the, put it in order on what states I was in at what age. But um, I made it back. I was in Pittsburgh, um, had my own place, 16, and I was working in a dentist office downtown. I ran into a guy that I'd went to school with, and um, I fell in love. And um, we started dating, and we drank together. And this is kind of where my story veers off, and out of respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not going to go into detail. But I didn't do a whole lot of drinking the next three years. I was not sober one day of those three years, but um, I didn't really drink much. Um, We did some things, and I thought I was a grown up and I was living this adventurous life. Um, At one point we decided that we uh, wanted to, um, we were done with Pittsburgh, so we were gonna go to Alabama. So we hitchhiked from Pittsburgh to Alabama. And I I thought, like at the time, I was on this big adventure. I was living life. I was really doing what I was supposed to be doing. And um, I was just really stupid. so Alabama didn't work out, made it back to Pittsburgh. I mean, we were back and forth. Eventually, I, we landed in Florida, and um, I'm not drinking, not really partying at all, still not sober, though, and um, I'm working nonstop. This guy is just like, he's doing his thing, and I was really tired, um, just exhausted mentally, emotionally. I was done, and I called my mama and said I want to come home, and um, at that at that time, she was in South Carolina, and I was on the next flight home. And um, with each move that I made, um, it was like, okay, I'm going to start over. I'm going to change. I'm going to do something different this time. Um, you know, so when I went to South Carolina, I enrolled in school. I got two jobs. Um, I got my own car. Um, and life was great. Um, but even that short period, those three years that I wasn't drinking, when I started drinking again, when I moved to South Carolina, the progression, um, within a year I had three DUIs, um, uh, and I was out of control. Um, I dropped out of school, went through a series of relationships. The last one, um, he finally had had enough of my drinking and and what I was doing when I drank, and and, uh, he asked me to choose. And um, mm -mm. no, Uh, if you were going to ask me to choose between alcohol and you, you got to go because I'm I'm not giving up the way, you know, my drinking. It's just not going to happen. No matter how much I wanted that relationship to work and how much it hurt, um, alcohol was definitely way more important um, getting drunk was. So that ended. And um, so it was time to move on again. And I left South Carolina, went to Pittsburgh. That didn't last long. And um, my grandma called me and she said, why don't you come to Tennessee? There's a school here. You can enroll in school. You can start over and again that's what I did nobody knew me I'd have a fresh start and again I sought out those same friends um, when I got to school Um, my first week of school there um, I was hospitalized Um, first night that everybody goes out right before classes start you know we all went to Cotton Eye Joe's and I remember the first couple shots and the next day I woke up in the hospital um, because my roommate couldn't wake me up and so they had to pump my stomach and so you know they you hear about the walk of shame well first week of classes I'm walking back up to my dorm in a hospital gown and slippers at like nine o'clock in the morning on Monday morning for class Um, and that that's kind of how Tennessee went (laughs) Um, same, same stuff. Um, Tennessee, though, is where I started to get really angry. Um, before, I'd always been a happy-go-lucky drunk. You know, I didn't really, just really wasn't mad. Um, but in Tennessee, um, my anger started to come out. Um, I never stopped, tried to stop drinking up until that point. I never saw a reason to. Um, I never, I mean, I don't think that I, I didn't think that I had a problem. Um, 
I got into another relationship. Again, this man asked me the, to stop drinking. So I said, okay, let me take a look at my drinking. Um, a lot of people have been making comments. I'd been having, you know, I started getting banned from bars. Um, you know, people weren't calling me anymore because of the things I was doing. Um, you know, it was, it was common to black out. I never intended to black out. Um, but I'm 100 pounds trying to drink like the men and pretty proud that I can, but I can't remember it the next day. Um, <clears throat> so I went to a few AA meetings. I had a girl that I worked with. I was a bartender at the time. And I, so I switched my schedule. I was going to bartend during the day and not at night because I'm not going to drink during the day and, or at least at work. And, um, so I started, I went to a few meetings. I was really uncomfortable. Nobody really talked to me. I didn't want to be there anyway. I was only there because I was trying to save this relationship. And, um, so I started drinking again. I made it about 30 days. No alcohol. I was drinking NyQuil around the clock, though, because I had to have something in me at all times. Um, I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. I, I didn't know how to function in a social situation. I didn't know how to clean my house without drinking. I, I didn't know how to do anything without drinking. Um, it was ingrained in every aspect of my life. So when I started drinking again after, you know, sober for those 30 days, um, I went on a bender, and it, I'd been up for like three days, and I, I finally, I just, I'd had enough. I, I was tired. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I remember one night, I was home alone, and I got down on my knees, and I prayed. I begged, please help me. I cannot continue to do this. And I'd never prayed before, or nothing to that effect. You know, I prayed for things that I wanted, um, you know, when I was a kid. And, but I'd never had a God in my life at all. And I got out the phone book, and um, I started calling around to, like, detoxes and hospitals and stuff. And nobody would help me. I couldn't get in anywhere. And I felt so defeated, and I was like, all right, okay. Then I guess I'm just going to drink. And um, I was kind of happy with that solution anyway, but, um, so that relationship ended, and I moved again, and, um, I picked up, and I went to Savannah, Georgia. I don't really remember much about Savannah. Um, I remember that you could walk anywhere in Savannah with alcohol in your hand as long as it was in a plastic cup, um, so I did that a lot. Yeah, I could fill, like, a big cup of Jaeger and just go walking around downtown. I lived really close to downtown, um, but the anger was getting, you know, the, the it was coming out more and more when I drank. Um, and I screwed over several roommates there. Um, and so I left Savannah. Um, went back to Tennessee. Um, and when, when I got back to Tennessee, I was in my mid-20s, somewhere in there. And um, my life was pretty shitty. Um, I was unemployable. Um, <sighs> I couldn't stop drinking. I was living on a friend's couch. Um, you know, I just had nothing, absolutely nothing going on for me. All those times I picked myself up and said, okay, I'm going to start over. I'm going to try, you know, in this city. I always thought, well, okay, well, I need to be in the South. Maybe if I'm in the South, then I'll be able to do better or whatever. But wherever I, I love this phrase, wherever I went, it took me with me. So <laughs> um, it never worked out. But um, this time that I was in Tennessee, um, I got a job, got fired because I could not make it to work on time. Because I was positive that if as long as I'm there five to ten minutes within the time I'm supposed to be at work, then I'm on time, right? I would seriously argue that point with my boss. And um, so eventually I got fired. And uh, um, <clears throat> Cinco de, it was Cinco de Mayo, 2008. And um, again, I'd been up for a couple days. Um, we'd been drinking, and uh, we decided to go hiking down a waterfall. And I'd been hiking down this waterfall many, many times. And um, I got designated to carry the cooler of beer. And I'm going to tell this story honestly, because I, when I got sober and I would tell this story, I didn't realize it, but I would never blame the alcohol. I would never blame the fact that I was drunk. I would never blame the fact that, you know, I'd been up for three days. Um, it was always because I was wearing flip-flops or I was carrying the cooler of beer or whatever. And that's how I told all the stories of all my accidents because I was 
accident prone when I drank. Um, you know, the car accident that I had was because the girl in the car went to sleep. It wasn't because I'd been up for 24 hours drinking um, and only taken like an hour break. Um, I always blamed everybody else for everything. It was never my fault and it most certainly was not due to the fact that I'd been drinking. Because if that were the case, then I might have to stop and take a look at, you know, well, maybe, and I didn't want to do that. So um, I ended up falling off the side of that waterfall and um, went to the hospital. Um, I shattered my foot. While they were carrying me out of that waterfall, um, the girl that I was with went and collected all of those beers. And when I got out of the hospital and I got home that night to her couch, um, we sat and drank all those beers, and I thought there was absolutely nothing wrong with it. Like, it was the best thing. I, I ended up getting to drink that day. Um, that's all I was thinking about, not the fact that I could have just died um, again. And they told me I wasn't going to walk again, um, and if I did, that I would never walk the same. I would never be able to run. Um, and so I, was, I had to go back to my mom's house, and um, I went to her house. I had surgery on that foot, and... Um, again, I'm unemployable, um, I'm miserable, I'm lonely, um, nothing going for me. And I sat, I was in a cast, so I couldn't really go anywhere, do anything. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a license because I'd lost that when I was 20 and never bothered to go back to get it. Um, I sat for about eight months. I was there in that cast um, every single day and took the meds that they gave me um, and drank all day long. My mom sometimes would get up for work and I would still be up drinking. And um, I don't, I just, I, I was miserable. But I got the cast off. I was able to walk. Um, so I moved to Charlotte, got a job. And um, at this point I just, I, I didn't care about anything else but getting drunk, going to work. I went to work because I had to work. I had to pay for my alcohol somehow. Um, but nothing else mattered to me. Like, I, I, I tried school. It wasn't my thing. Um, you know, I tried relationships. I couldn't make them work. Um, they always made me choose between my best friend or them, and, and alcohol always won out. Um, so I'm living with a friend. Um, I... I'm drinking nonstop. Um, this is when I started drinking before I went to work. And uh, I had this friend that she, um, she had twins, so she was always up really early in the morning, and I would talk to her every day on my way to work. And um, there was this really hot guy on the bus, because I'd had to take the bus to work. And so we came up with this brilliant idea that if I drank more in the morning, then I would be able to work up the courage to talk to this guy. And that made perfect sense to me. Like, that's how my thinking was. So that's what I started doing. Instead of just drinking one glass of wine in the morning, I started doing shots at 5.30 in the morning before I went to work and never talked to him either. Um, <laughs> probably a good thing. But um, <clears throat> I... Uh, Again, got to a point where I was just tired. I was tired of what I was doing and, and wanted something different, wanted to change. I, I, just, I really just wanted a break. Like I wanted to go to you know, detox or rehab for a little bit just to get a break. And so I went to my boss and I said, uh, you know, I told him what was going on and that I thought I had a problem and um, if there was something we could work out where I could still have my job when I you know, got out. And he looked at me and he said, um, that's great. Um, you've just validated what we thought you know, all this time, that you've been coming to work drunk every single day and you're fired. And again, I'm like, Jesus, you know, here I am trying to ask for help and they're like, whatever. And so um, I said, okay, well, I'll show you. I'll go start collecting unemployment and drinking nonstop. And that's, that's what I started doing. And um, I started hanging around people that I really had no business being around. I ended up leaving that roommate, going and living with this lady that... Um, and I'm um, spending all of my time in the bar. If I wasn't drunk, I was thinking about getting drunk, or I was hungover and I was sleeping. Um, blackouts regularly. Um, and I had made this, I'd, I'd met this guy um, at a bar one night, and we kind of remained friends, and um, he started calling me, and um, I got along with him really well, and for some reason, 
I don't know, I, I felt really comfortable with them, and so I thought, well, maybe I can try making another relationship work, maybe. And I, I saw, like, hope in this relationship. I saw that this guy could probably fix me. That's what I exactly what I was thinking, that if I made this relationship work, that I wouldn't want to stop, that I would want to stop. Um, that if I got married and, you know, did the whole little family thing, that that, that that's what I needed. Because I to me, I tried everything else. I tried rehabs. I tried, um, you know, moving, obviously, a thousand times. Um, nothing that I had tried worked. I'd never really tried to stop drinking. Um, but so we get together. We immediately get married. Um, <laughs> my wedding... Um, it was interesting. We um, <laughs> we had started buying alcohol for the reception, like you know, weeks in advance. And um, so my best friend gets into town three days before the wedding, and we proceeded to drink all of the alcohol that we had bought for the reception, and then some. And we were up for three days before the wedding. And when my family showed up my house that morning, um, to, to so we could all leave together, um, my eyes were this big around. I couldn't form a sentence. I couldn't talk. I could barely get ready. Um, and just the the look on my, my mother's face, mm -hmm. like, holy shit, are you kidding me? Um, but I just, I didn't have anything to say. I didn't know what to say. Um, and so we got married. And um, he, he drank like me. Up to that point, he drank with me, he partied with me, but once we got married, all of that changed, and he wanted me to stop, or not stop, but, you know, tone it down a bit. And I was extremely resentful at that. Like, how dare you tell me? You've been fine with it up to this point. I felt duped, like, okay, now that we're married, now I have to change who I am. And I, I got really resentful, and so I, I drank more and more, and I started hiding it. Um, Something I thought I would I'd never have to do, but I mean, I had alcohol hit all over the house, lying constantly. Um, and then I got pregnant. Um, and I knew, I knew when I had a baby that I would not want to drink. The love of a child would make me, that would fill that void, that hole that I'd been trying to fill all those years, that it would give me that ease and comfort, um, make me feel like I had some sort of purpose because I never felt like I had a purpose. Um, like I, I just felt like a shell going about the motions all the time. And this was give me a purpose. Um, and I couldn't stay sober. I couldn't. I just couldn't. Um, I tried. I tried really hard. Um, but it, it, the obsession, um, it, it was constant. Um... So that husband had had enough, of course, and um, he thought that I was a danger to my child, which I was, and he took her in the middle of the night one night, and um, uh, I went a few weeks without seeing her. We went to court. The courts got involved, um, and um, I immediately went to AA because I knew that's what the judge was going to want to hear. She was what she was going to want to see. And I knew I needed to change. I knew if I wanted to see that little girl that I was going to have to change, that I was going to have to try and stay sober. Um, and one of the reasons that I never went to AA is because I never, ever said out loud that I'm an alcoholic, ever. I, I felt like as soon as I said those words out loud that, that it was the, the gig was up and that I'd have to do something. Um, I'd been begged by family, by that husband, to, to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I thought that if I went to like a counselor or a therapist, somebody that would pick my brain, um, they would tell me like all the stuff that happened in my childhood and that's why I drink. And I could figure it out, work through it, and and we'll come to find out that it's the steps on the wall and in the big book and I ended up doing that anyway. But um, so, so I started going to AA. I got a sponsor, started working the steps, I guess. Um, we got to the God thing and, you know, they said pick... A door, the doorknob, the, the group, whatever, and um, so I said the doorknob, and um, that's as much, that's as far as I went. I didn't, I didn't try and like develop a relationship. Um, I didn't know anything about relationships. I had never been able to have a successful relationship in my life. Um, it was all about me all the time. Um, I didn't know how to give at all, and. Um, 
you know, my sponsor had given me some suggestions because there's no rules in AA, and one of those was don't get into a relationship. And I, <laughs> no, you don't know me. I can do this. Um, and I got into a relationship three months sober, and I got drunk um, within, I don't know, three weeks, a month. Um, I just couldn't handle I just couldn't handle it. Um, I'd have gotten a little bit of custody back of my daughter. I was seeing her, you know, um, like I, I had like almost 50-50 with her. And um, when I got drunk, um, the first day that I got drunk, I met, she missed a doctor's appointment. So my husband was already on like high alert, wondering what was going on. And um, he really found out when uh, we decided, I decided, me and this guy that I got drunk with that was in the program, <coughs> I decided that we need to go on a trip, that we needed to leave, of course, because everything would be better if we left. So we went, I wanted to take them to Savannah, Georgia. So we get down to Savannah, and within 24 hours, um, I was in the hospital for ODing. Um, we were there a total of four days. I was hospitalized twice and arrested twice. And um, I was in absolute hell. I could not stop drinking. I wanted to, but I, I just, I couldn't. And but I didn't want to keep living the way that I was living. Like it was killing me and I knew it, but I had no idea how to, how to stop. Um, well, the ex-husband happened to be the one to come down to Savannah and pick me up from the hospital. So now he knew everything that was going on and um, I couldn't hide it from him and I lost complete custody of my, my daughter. Um, <clears throat> I kept drinking for about another month. Um, Again, I was, I was arrested two more times, um, hospitalized, I think, one more time. Um, I tried to kill myself again because um, I saw no way out. I couldn't stand living with the way I was living, um, but I couldn't stop drinking. And um, so finally, you know, going back and forth with the treatment center, um, I said I was going to go and then I'd run. Um, and... Finally, my mom talked me into going. I got into the treatment center, and I was angry, so angry, so mad at myself, um, but I blamed everyone around me. I blamed that AA group that I'd been a part of because they didn't save me. They didn't protect me from that man. They didn't reach out to me enough. I mean, it was everybody else's fault around me um, why I got drunk again and why I continued to drink. Um, cause again, I'd done my part. I'd done everything I was supposed to, and I still got drunk and I did not understand it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so I get into treatment, fog clears a little bit and the counselor tells me that I should probably go to a halfway house. And, um, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to live with seven other women. I'm 30 years old or however old I was. And absolutely not. Not going to do it. And then I went back to my room and I thought about it. And I talked to Paige on the phone. Um, I love Paige, but she wasn't very kind that day. <laughs> and... <laughs> Well, I was telling her shit, I mean, asking her dumb questions, and I, she was just like, are you going to come or are you not going to come? I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't feeding into my trying to manipulate the situation at all. Um, so I went back to my room, and I thought about it, and I, you know, I had nowhere to go. My family was done. They, I mean, I, was, I hadn't been allowed in their home, um, really, and especially unsupervised. Someone had to be there at all times with me um, because if they weren't, I would find the alcohol that was hidden in the house and I would drink it or I would, I would run again. Um, but they just didn't want me there. Um, you know, I'd beat down a door in their house. I, I wouldn't have wanted me there anymore. I, you never knew what it was going to happen when I was around. I couldn't tell you what was going to happen, and they were sick of it, and they were done. So I couldn't go there. I, you know, pretty much alienated anybody that cared about me, um, and I wasn't working. I didn't have any money. My, my option was to go back to that guy that I'd gotten drunk with or find some friend, another friend that, that I could drink with, or I could try and do something different. And so I said, okay, and um, I came here to Southern Pines to the house. <coughs> The feeling of relief that I had, um, huh. I didn't want to be there. I was angry. Um, I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to deal with any of the any of it. 
Um, I just wanted someone to make it better, someone to fix it for me and send me on my way. But I don't know. I don't. Something happened when I got there. I just felt at home in a halfway house. I felt at home. I felt safe. I was comfortable. Um, the women that were there, um, they weren't there to judge me. They weren't there to, you know, try and make me do it their way. Um, they were there to love me and to help me. And I felt that immediately when I got there. Um, when I walked into this building, I don't remember the first time because I know I was sick my first week in the halfway house, so I didn't have to go anywhere. Um, and, and so, uh, so I don't remember. I don't remember the first week of meetings, but I do remember just the feeling I got coming into the Aberdeen building. And I don't know what it is about it, um, but I felt home finally. Finally, I felt like I could breathe for that hour that I was here when I walked into this room. I felt comfortable. Um, just re absolute relief. I hadn't even started working the steps yet. I just felt like finally I don't have to run anymore because I'd been running for so long, running away from me. And um, <clears throat> I got a sponsor. I joined the home group. Um, and I, I got as active as I possibly could. I started working the steps with my sponsor. And I don't remember when the obsession was lifted. I want to say it was around the third step. Um, but that's the greatest gift that I've gotten out of that this program has given me and that being sober has given me. I never thought that I would be able to wake up and not wonder when I was going to drink, how I was going to drink, who I was going to drink with, and that I had to freaking get something to drink. <clears throat> I just, I, just crawling out of my skin all my life and having to put something in my body to make me feel comfortable um, and the relief of not having to do that anymore. Um, when we got to the God, we got to third step. Um, I don't, I know this sounds weird, but I don't really remember working the third step with my sponsor, but I remember a lot of stuff that I heard in these rooms about letting go. And I was struggling with it really bad. And um, I was talking with a woman in the program about it. And there's certain points in my sobriety where someone has said something, and I've probably heard it a hundred times, but they'll say it, and at that one instant, it'll click, and it'll make sense. And I get it. And this particular time, we were talking about God, and um, I'm arguing all of my, you know, my points. And um, either one of them was that say, that phrase, God will, oh shit, um, God will not give you more than you can handle. And I'm like, that is the dumbest, I hate that phrase. I hate, I just hate it. And she said to me, yeah, he will. He'll give you more than you can handle, and he'll continue to keep giving you more than you can handle until you come to him. And it clicked with me. It gives me chills just thinking about it. Because all my life, I, you know, I thought I didn't believe in God, didn't really have one. But I'd always been blaming him for everything that had happened to me. Why me? Why me? Um, why my child, you know, why was my childhood that way? If, if it hadn't have been that way, then I would be different. And, you know, I, I did. I blamed everything on a God that I didn't understand, that knew nothing about, never tried to have a relationship with. And when she said that to me, it made absolute sense that all the sh stuff that I've gone through for all these years were not um, punishments. It was not for me to suffer. It was for me to come to him. And I finally got it. And the... It was like an aha moment, and I was able to continue with the rest of the steps. And um, the fourth step, I was ready. I was so, people are so scared of the fourth step. I was incredibly ready to get that shit out and be done with it and quit carrying it around. I'd been carrying it around for however many years, and I was so ready to write it down, get it out, tell it to another woman, and move on and not have to continue to have that weight on my shoulders. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, I just, the, the blessings, the gifts that I've gotten from getting sober, Alcoholics Anonymous, these rooms are things that 
I never ever envisioned for myself. Um, I never ever thought I could be peaceful. I never thought that I could be alone and be okay with it. I never thought that that I could be kind to others. Um, that was one of the, the you know, Anger is a big, big one for me, and having to let go of anger and, and try and work on that character defect, that's always been my MO. That's always been my immediate go-to, um, and I don't have to be angry all the time anymore, and I don't have to blame people all the time. I can take responsibility for my shit and be okay with it and work on it. Um, <clears throat> I thought that I needed to get all those material things back. I needed to, well, I needed to get my daughter back and I needed to get the car and the job and all of that. And I don't have some of those things today, but I'm happier than I've ever been. I don't need the material stuff. The stuff that, that I have today, um, the, the friendships that I've made, um, the ability to love somebody else, um, I never thought that I could do that. I still work on sympathy and empathy. It's not my strong suit, but I try because I've never, I've never been sympathetic. Sympathetic. Nobody's ever been that way with me. Nobody's ever had sympathy for me when they didn't because I was doing it to myself and I couldn't see that. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. My life is so different today, and it's so good, so incredibly wonderful, and I owe it all to these rooms, to this program. Um, Paige was sharing in a meeting the other night about the suggestions and how we only have suggestions, and um, again, it clicked with me. When I finally became willing and made those suggestions, my rules, not something that, eh, I'm going to take that one. But I'm not gonna. I'm gonna do this one, but I won't do that one. But the suggestions that that woman was giving me that knew how to stay sober, and I had no clue how to stay sober and make those my rules on how to live because I didn't know how to live, is when it really started to to work for me. Um, it's continuous action. Um, I have to continue on a daily basis to to try and have a relationship with a higher power. Um, of my understanding. It doesn't have to be yours it, because I thought for a long time I had to have yours because you stayed sober so I want your God because I don't know how to do it and I have a relationship with a God that I kind of understand today. Um, I try and keep it as simple as possible. The phrases that we have in AA, all the ones that are on the wall, I hear people say, I hate your stupid phrases, or it's just, I love the phrases. Because when I'm out there and something goes wrong or something pops into my head, or um, one of those phrases immediately come to me, whether it let live and let live. When I want to cuss somebody out because they're annoying me, live and let live. You know, or just whatever. Those, That's what I go to. Because um, I can't remember the big book. I can't quote the big book. Um... And half the time I can't remember what my sponsor tells me, but it's those little phrases that come to my mind um, that help me on a daily basis. Um, and the one that, that I think try and think of every single day, or I do, and, and Richard says it all the time, if the three things that, that I can do today that I probably have a really good chance of staying sober is trust God, clean house, and help others. And if at the end of the day I've done those three things, um, <coughs> then I'm doing pretty good. I don't have to I don't have to be doing anything great or grand today. Um, you know, the grass isn't greener on the other side. Just being today right where I am is amazing for me. So now I'm starting to ramble. I think that's it.